This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. It explains every sub element in detail, contains an easy to read stoplight so you can track current status for each sub element. It provides you with a three step verification for completion of each sub element. There's even a notes section for you to compile language that will eventually be used for your VPP application. It even comes complete with graphs to show current state and track your progress moving forward. Look, achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own safety pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. This episode, I want to get into confined spaces and permit required confined spaces. Now, I need to break this topic up into a couple of different episodes, beginning with a general introduction to terms, definitions, you know, emergency response, some training requirements. And I got to cover all that before we get into specifics around the actual entry permits themselves, the entry procedures, monitoring things like that. We'll get into that in the next episode. So this episode, let's just focus on those general, you know, laying the general foundation, getting us prepared, getting us ready to go into the specifics around the permit required confined space standard. So you're going to find the confined space standard in uh, 29 CFR 1910.146. So we're going to focus on general industry for this one. So let's define some terms so that as we go forward, when I use some terms, uh, we kind of got an understanding of the definition and, you know, what we're referring to, right? So according to the standard, a confined space, this is any space. We're not talking about permit required confined space at this point, just your general garden variety confined space. That is any space that is one large enough and configured that an employee can actually bodily enter and perform assigned work. Two, has limited or restricted means for entry or exit. Three, is not designed for continuous human occupancy. So that last part, let's talk about that last part for a moment. OSHA defines continuous human occupancy rather vaguely, but you can use the following question, answer the following question sort of as your benchmark. Can the worker safely remain inside the space during space operation? So we're talking about, you know, not being exposed to a recognized hazard while inside, like moving or rotating parts, live electrical components, gases, fumes, you know, filling it up with liquid, things like that. That's a good way for you to, if you're scratching your head going, well, you know, they can hang out in there. And I've heard all kinds of excuses. I've heard there's a door that you can walk through. I've heard there's a light in there. So obviously it was designed to be hanging out in there and doing stuff because there's a light. No, the question I always start with is when we put this space back into operation, can a person be in there? More often than not, it's no, or you can find some other recognized hazard that gets introduced that, you know, you definitely don't want an employee in that space when it's put back into service. Continuous human occupancy, that's what we're talking about. Limited means or restricted means of entry or exit is another good one. You know, you could have a full-sized door, standard door, but once you get inside, the internal configuration or components or piping valves are such that you're twisting, contorting your body to get into the space to do the work. That's going to require you to twist, contort, stoop, bend, crawl to get out doesn't matter what size the door is. You also have to look at the internal configuration of the space as well. Furthermore, even if you have the internal configuration as such that you're not going to, you know, be 
over or under or behind some piping and valves, but the door is not your standard size door, it's a portal. If you're required to duck or step over in an emergency evacuation situation, that is considered restricted means of entry or exit. So you're gonna to need to assess and evaluate all the aspects of the space to determine whether or not it's considered a confined space according to this definition. So what would be considered a confined space according to this standard? Well, that could be tanks, vaults, uh, underground, even above ground, storage bins, manholes, pits, silos, uh, utility vaults, pipelines, all of that kind of stuff. Those are all examples of confined spaces. It really depends on you being able to assess the space in question. Now, OSHA states the employer shall evaluate the workplace to determine if any spaces are permit required confined spaces. So we talked about confined spaces. Now there is a subset of spaces that fall into this special category of permit required confined spaces. These are, according to the definition, confined spaces that we've already been able to define that also have or has the potential to have a hazardous atmosphere, the potential for engulfing an entrant, an internal configuration such that an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or by a floor which slopes downward or tapers to a smaller cross section, or, this is the big one, contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazard that will move your garden variety confined space into a subcategory of permit required confined space. And if your workplace contains any permit spaces, you have to inform exposed employees, even contractors, by posting danger signs or by any other equally effective means of the existence and location and the danger posed by the permit spaces. I always recommend controlling access further by adding physical locks when possible, especially if your company policy is that none of your employees are permitted to enter these spaces. This is just going to add another level of security to those you know, signs and labels that you're going to put on these where these spaces are located. Securing their entrance or entry points is a good layer, added layer of protection. Okay, so for me, starting with managing the spaces themselves as well as the activities in and around these spaces is the key to ensuring worker safety. It all starts with making sure that you're prepared to respond to any emergency in the workplace. I mean, not just confined spaces, you take this in general, in your workplace in general, you need to be prepared for any possible emergency that could arise. In this case, we're talking about emergencies related to confined space entry operations. So let's start talking about emergency services. Now, whether you, again, whether you have confined spaces or not, emergency services, it's critical for any workplace. First and foremost, you need to determine whether or not emergency crews are able to reach your facility in what OSHA calls a reasonable amount of time for life-threatening situations. All right, what's reasonable? So according to OSHA, in workplaces where serious accidents, such as those involving falls, suffocation, electrocution, or amputation, whenever those are possible, emergency medical services must be available within three to four minutes. And that is if there are no employees on site who are trained to render first aid. That's a key distinction. So making sure that you can meet this standard is where we're going to start. Now, OSHA does recognize that a somewhat longer response time of up to 15 minutes may be reasonable only in workplaces like in office environments where the possibility of serious, you know, life-threatening situations would be more remote. But in general, when we're talking an industrial environment, you know, we're talking about amputations, we're talking about electrocutions, we're talking about some industrial hazards, that benchmark is three to four minutes. Also, this is important, OSHA has interpreted the standard for permit required confined space entry to require a separate, that's either in-house or outside, rescue and emergency service 
when the permit space entry operations are performed in an immediately dangerous to life and health atmosphere or IDLH atmosphere. So you're going to have to have somebody on standby. And what this means is any condition that poses an immediate or delayed threat to life that would cause irreversible adverse health effects or that would interfere with an individual's ability to escape unaided from the permit space. When you're doing space entry activities right after inerting activities where there could be pockets of nitrogen in oxygen deficient atmospheres, even in permit space entry operations involving non-IDLH atmospheres, more than one rescuer may be required in permit space entry operations depending on the hazards present and this is the big one, the number of authorized entrants that may require rescue. If you think about it, you have one attendant with a tripod. How is one attendant going to retrieve three entrants and be able to render first aid to all three of them? There are areas of the standard that would require multiple rescue personnel, either on site in the IDLH example or available to render aid if multiple entrants are involved. So the minimum number of people required to perform work that is covered by OSHA standards for permit required confined space entry and respiratory protection standards will be driven by facts like the hazard, potential hazards, number of entrants, the configuration and size of the space. What all of this is telling us is that planning is critical. You need to understand your facilities. That's going to set you up for how many people do I need trained? How many people do I need available on each shift? How many people do I need staffed for one particular maintenance activity? Uh, do I need to call a contractor? And this is all, you know, knowing all of this up front and assessing your workplace and documenting these hazards uh, and the nature of the hazards, that is going to help you with the next step. Now, a note here about when using outside services that are able to meet your response time. So 911 or a private, you know, outside service, you have to consider the following. Have they been out to see your facility? Have the emergency crews been out to visit your facility? Have they done a walkthrough of some high hazard processes and activities, not just confined spaces, but they may be responding to other emergencies as well. So having them out is key. Are they equipped to manage the type of emergencies your site may present? Many rural departments or volunteer fire departments, for example, in EMS, they may lack some of the tools and, and gear and resources that may be needed. What about, um, have you had emergency services uh, or crews trained or conduct simulated rescues at your site? Have they been to your site to do their training? and simulate some rescues. So th those are all things that I recommend that you look at when you're determining and you're, and you're setting up this sort of foundation for your confined space entry program and how you're gonna manage spaces and the activities involved. You're going to need to be looking at these things as well. Also, you're gonna to have to do this up front. You're gonna to have to consider this up front. Keeping track of who is entering these spaces at any given time is going to be critical. Whether they're contractors or your own employees, knowing when entries are taking place and tracking the entrance is a major part of the OSHA requirements. And since safety and security starts with knowing who's on site, this is a great place to stop and tell you about an incredible service called Who's On Location. This service handles visitor management, contractor management, employee attendance, and evacuation management. So let me tell you about their evacuation management service. In order to keep your people safe in an emergency, you have to know where they should be and be able to quickly verify that they're safe. Who's on location evacuation management helps you do just this. Get your people safe and give first responders critical information about who cannot be accounted for before they put their lives at risk. You can roll call employees, visitors, and contractors. They're able to swipe their name from the present on-site list when they are safe. You can send everyone on-site a request via text to confirm that they are safe in just a few clicks. They reply with the safe 
response, which auto removes them from the list of people you need to verify still. That's handy. What's more, listen to this. If someone replies with anything other than safe, it is relayed to all app users in case someone is nearby and able to render assistance. It is available for iOS, both phone and iPad, Microsoft, both phone and Surface, and Android phone and tablet as a web application. Get a 30-day free trial by going to whosonlocation.com. You get access to all of the features and add-ons. No credit card is required. Again, go to whosonlocation.com for a free 30-day trial today. And sticking with our incredible partners in safety, I have to mention the official floor tape, floor sign company of the Safety Pro podcast, Mighty Line Floor Tape. Now, you know OSHA requires marking permit spaces, and many of these are pits and vaults and similar spaces. They have floor entries. So your average sign is not going to stand up to the harsh conditions of most industrial environments when you start putting these down on the floor. Mighty Line floor signs are a great product to help regulate not just workplace traffic, but indicate hazards associated with your site. These signs are customizable to fit exactly what your company needs. And not only that, but Mighty Line floor tape is seven times thicker than the average floor tape, and their patented technology makes it more durable as well. The beveled edge increases durability for forklift traffic, and the peel and stick adhesive removes easily. And it's all made right here in the USA. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, get a free sample of Mighty Line floor tape, and you can even catch past episodes of the Safety Pro podcast right on their website. Again, go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast for a free sample. Okay, so keeping track of who is on site and who's involved in entry operations is a key aspect of your program. This gets us into the permit entry system. This is your written procedure for preparing and issuing permits for entry and for returning the permit space to service following any you know, termination of entry activities. This is important. For a permit required confined space, no entry is allowed unless a written entry permit is completed. You have identified the trained attendant, entrance, entry supervisor. We're going to go all into all of this in detail in the next episode, but and, and you have to have documented each hazard of the space and how each hazard is mitigated. Now, since deaths in confined spaces often occur because the atmosphere is oxygen deficient or toxic, confined spaces, they need to be tested prior to entry and continuously monitored. Check out this statistic. It's insane. More than 60% of confined space fatalities occur among would-be rescuers. That is folks going in to help a fallen coworker. Therefore, a well-designed and properly executed rescue plan is a must. And this starts with training. They have to understand they cannot make entry into these spaces if they don't know the hazards that befell their coworker or they're not equipped to protect themselves from that hazard themselves. You know, they can't go in if somebody's passed out. They're not going to be able to go in and grab them. They may think they are, but statistically, we're looking at numbers, they're not. It's not going to happen. So if spaces are properly evaluated prior to entry and continuously monitored while the work is being performed, and you have appropriate rescue procedures in place and the right training, fewer incidents would occur. Now, OSHA considers entry into a space to have been made whenever any part of the entrance body breaks the plane of the space opening. That's an OSHA standard. However, a word of caution, hazards may still be present right outside the space opening. Sort of like uh, when a space has undergone nitrogen purging, an oxygen deficient atmosphere could exist right, just feet right outside the opening. And someone could be like just bending down to look inside with a flashlight, you know, without breaking the plane and then become overcome pass out or even fall into the space and this has happened in the past and there had the it has led to fatalities you can look these up it's insane the amount of hazards people just overlook involving confined space entry they think everything is inside the space when we could be dealing with a lot of hazards just outside the space that lead to just as many fatalities 
So, just because OSHA says you have to break the plane to have made entry, don't forget about the general environmental control standard that OSHA has that applies to everywhere outside the space. Now, let's stop there with entry procedures and save that specific topic for the next episode, you know, diving into how to fill out the permit and how to coordinate entry activities and then back out of that, all that good stuff. We're going to go into the specifics in the next episode. I wanted to give you an overview of what's involved and what to expect moving forward. Now that you have an idea of what these spaces are, according to OSHA, and some of the requirements, let's focus on preparing for confined space operations in general. And the word we're going to use to describe that is training. Employees need to be trained before they're assigned any duties related to confined space work. So I can break these into some categories. Number one, general safety. Number two, entrance. Number three, attendance. And number four, supervisors. For general safety training, all employees, regardless of their role in space activities, they need to understand the common hazards present or that may be present in any of the spaces they may be working with, especially hazards they, they may sell themselves be introducing, right? Like, are they cutting, welding? Are they using chemicals, electrical equipment, things like that? So the space itself, you may understand you know, what's in there, but what are you doing in these spaces that introduces a hazard that isn't already present? Training also has to include signs and symptoms of exposure to certain hazards. Everybody from the supervisor to the attendant to the entrant, they need to understand signs and symptoms of exposure, slurred speech, confusion, delayed reaction time in answering questions. So, you know, the attendant, we'll get into this in, in much more detail, but the attendant needs to understand signs and symptoms. The entrants do as well, as well as the entry supervisor, especially since some of these roles are interchangeable. You might be relieving somebody for long entry uh, activities. Everybody needs to be trained on signs and symptoms, what to look for and all that stuff. They also need to understand how hazards are to be controlled and the monitoring equipment used in these spaces. General training also has to include how to respond in an emergency. If you do rely on 911 or local emergency services, this again, assuming you already verified they're able to perform such rescues, they need to go over the communication system to be used prior to work beginning, right? You gotta cover that with everybody from the entrant, the attendant, and the supervisor. Are we using two-way radios? Are we using a cell phone? Are we using the shop phone? How are we going to be notifying or summoning rescue services that has to be spelled out before entry begins? So you're going to have to include that into your training. According to the standard, you have to develop and implement procedures for summoning rescue and emergency services, for rescuing entrants from permit spaces, for providing necessary emergency services to rescued employees, and for preventing unauthorized personnel from attempting a rescue. You have to have all this covered, not only in your written program, but you have to cover it in training as well. Can't stress that enough. Also, if there is any fall protection or retrieval equipment being used, they have to be properly trained on its setup and use, especially if non-entry rescue is being utilized. This is critical. Now, you can see that knowing the confined spaces standard is not enough. This is an example of you've got to know general safety requirements, the PPE regs, fall protection regs, respiratory protection regs, emergency services and first aid. I could go on and on. It's not enough just to know the confined space standard in the OSHA uh, rule book, right? You've got to be familiar with many other standards because confined space entry is what we call a vertical standard. It's very specific to that operation, but you, it's going to reference a bunch of other standards when we talk about managing safety around entry procedures and activities. Attendants need to know all of the general training requirements as well as the need to remain at the space at all times. They cannot perform any other duties that interfere with being an attendant. The entrant, for example, you can't yell out to the attendant, hey, uh, grab me this wrench or something, and the attendant runs to the toolbox real quick and grabs it. You can't do that. They also, the attendant, can't be chatting up another site worker about the game that was on last night. The, nothing like that. The, this attendant has one job and one job only, and it's to watch the back of the entrance to make sure that they are 
not being overcome or affected by any potential hazards that could be introduced into the site or present in the site, making sure that they're checking in audibly and visually with them periodically throughout the entry activities, uh, and be able to terminate the entry permit at any time. They have to have the authority to pull people out of the space if something is going on. Here's an example. You got to cover this in training. If an attendant has something going on on the surface, on the ground level at a production facility, for some reason, a truck is pulling in to unload something and it's going to get into the area of the uh, entry, space entry, and it's going to be a distraction. That attendant has to evacuate the space, pull everybody out, cease operations until that activity at, at the ground level is done so as not to create a distraction or not to uh, introduce another hazard. What if there's a sudden downpour? It starts raining. Hey, when you're outdoors making entry, that's got to be something on your permit that you that you account for. So the training has to include different hypotheticals and examples that you can give to the attendant to kind of give them some context of, okay, what would constitute me terminating entry space activities other than an emergency in the space? Well, this is one of them. Anything that would distract them or take them away from their duties or introduce a surface hazard that they're not able to pay attention to or control you would want to evacuate the space and cease operation. So that's a good example. The same goes for the entry supervisor. Now, the entry supervisor is responsible for ensuring all the sections of, of the permit have been addressed and filled out. No blank spots, right? Has to be addressed or acknowledged that something doesn't apply. You can't leave stuff blank. The entry supervisor can also serve as the attendant if they are trained to do both roles. But I always recommend that you have the, if you have the ability, use another layer of oversight by having someone else be the entry supervisor to make sure that that permit was filled out. Because, you know, with a two person operation at a minimum, you have an entrant and you have an attendant, and the attendant is making sure that the permit is filled out. Not that it wouldn't happen, but it, it could and has. You oversee, uh, you know, overlook something, skip something, and you're basically asking the attendant to audit themselves. So, I, if you're able to and you have the personnel, I would have another person be the entry supervisor as far as ensuring the permit is filled out and completed and you have the pre-entry briefing and what that involves. Again, next episode, we're getting into specific stuff here, but all of that goes into your training. What the entry supervisor is supposed to be doing in their role, that's all part of the training. So it's a teaser for the next episode, I know, but the permit itself, we will go into detail, right? How to fill it out, terminating the space entry, how long you need to keep these on file, all that good stuff. I will have permit templates available, checklists for you so that you can get started. But this episode, I wanted to introduce to you the topic to you, talk about some of the definitions and training requirements just to kind of lay the foundation and get us started thinking about, you know, what do we do with our confined space program at our site? You know, do did we cover all this stuff? Did we account for all this stuff? I hope that this episode at least gives you something to go back into your facilities, into your sites, and to look at, you know, from a training and preparation standpoint, especially when I was talking about emergency services, getting them on site to look at your facilities and get familiar with your facilities, the location of entry points into your facilities, making sure that they have the right address listed for you. I know it sounds silly, but sometimes they have like the front office address and your production operations, you know, half a mile down the road or to the back. And it's a whole different entry point that makes sense for emergency services. So going over all that stuff and preparing for an emergency up front, planning for the worst case scenario and training for that and training with emergency services, Understanding what OSHA calls a confined space and what's the difference between just a confined space and a permit required confined space. Understanding all of that is key that you have to lay this foundation so that you can get your people trained properly and set us up for the next step, which is actual confined space operations, which we will get into in the next episode. So keep an ear out for the next one as we go deeper into this topic. Let me know what your thoughts are on confined spaces. I would like to cover 
some uh, frequently asked questions, as well as talk about some common letters of interpretation in the next episode. So that's going to help you improve your confined space entry program as well. Give me your thoughts, share your feedback, drop me an email, info at thesafetypropodcast.com or visit thesafetypropodcast.com and you can reach out to me from there as well. And until the next Safety Pro Podcast episode, please be safe. Mm -hmm.